Welcome, everyone. <laughs> I'm Jim Goldgaard, Dean of the School of International Service, and it's a great pleasure to have you all here. Uh, I also know that we have the speaker on uh, right outside this room, so if you're more comfortable just sitting on the, on the stairs right there, please feel free to move out to the stairs and you'll be able to uh, hear the event and you'll be able to, from the bottom four or so stairs, you'll be able to see pretty well. Uh, I want to uh, also welcome those who are watching this online uh, and we'll be taking questions from the online group uh, as we go along. Uh, and uh, I'd like to thank the chair of the SIS Dean's Council, Alan Fleischman, for playing the role of questions from the, taking the, fielding the questions from the online viewers. Uh, I also want to take this opportunity to thank the Center for Israel Studies here at AU for co-sponsoring this event uh, and the center's wonderful director, Laura Cutler, uh, with whom it's been such a great pleasure to work uh, during this past year or so that I've been on the job. Well, it's a great pleasure to have Ambassador Dennis Ross here, the Deagler Distinguished Fellow and Counselor at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Uh, Ambassador Ross served in the first term of, of the Obama administration uh, for two years as Special Assistant to President Obama as well as National Security Council Senior Director for the Central Region uh, after working for a year as Special Advisor to Secretary of State uh, Hillary Clinton uh, where he focused in particular on Iran. Uh, for more than 12 years, Ambassador Ross played a leading role in shaping U.S. involvement in the Middle East peace process and dealing directly with the parties in the negotiations. Uh, he was instrumental in assisting Israelis and Palestinians in reaching the 1995 Interim Agreement, uh, and he successfully brokered the 1997 Hebron Accord, facilitated the 1994 Israel-Jordan Peace Treaty, and intensively worked to bring Israel and Syria together. Prior to serving as Middle East Coordinator uh, for President Clinton, Ambassador Ross served as Director of the State Department's Policy Planning Staff in the George H.W. Bush Administration, uh, and uh, played a leading role in many of the events uh, connected with the end of the Cold War, uh, as well as the 1991 Gulf War. Uh, and he served previously uh, in the Reagan administration as Director for Near East and South Asian Affairs on the National Security Council staff and Deputy uh, Director of the Office of Net Assessment at the Pentagon. Uh, he's the author of a number of books, most recently Myths, Illusions, and Peace, Finding a New Direction for America in the Middle East, which he co-authored with David Makovsky. Uh, and uh, he also authored The Missing Peace, The Inside Story of the Fight for Middle East Peace, uh, as well as a book on statecraft that I recommend to all of you. Uh, and I'm very pleased that this fall, uh, Ambassador Ross joined the SIS Dean's Council. So it's great to have you here. Nice to be with you. I've known you since a short time. <laughs> We go back about 30 years, but who's counting? Yeah, who's counting, please. Um, so the way we're going to do this, I'm going to open with a few questions, and then uh, we'll turn it over to you all uh, as quickly as possible. So I wanted to start by asking you how we think about the peace process in the context of our overall strategy within the region. Because when you were serving as, as the Middle East uh, as a special coordinator for the Middle East peace process, the peace process was at the center of our strategy toward the region. And the way in which we thought about countries like Egypt and Syria and Jordan was in the context of the peace process. And you know, in the last couple of years, as the peace process has become moribund, and as we had the Arab Spring and, and the right. explosion of various events uh, in different parts of the region, it seemed, first of all, that we need a new paradigm for how we think about the region, uh, in which the, the peace process is not necessarily at the center. Um, but the first question is, is do we need a, a new paradigm? And if so, is it possible to have a strategy for the region? Uh, or are we lucky enough if we can figure out a policy toward Egypt, a policy toward Syria, a policy toward Jordan, a policy toward the Gulf, in addition to the policy toward Israel. Okay, next. Uh, <laughs> well, I know this is going to shock you when I say, let me put this in context. Um, let's take a step back. It is true during the Clinton administration that the peace process was, was at the center, but bear in mind why it was at the center. We had just fought the Gulf War, and the Gulf War was 
uh, was basically a war where the United States, uh, at a time when the Soviet Union was on the verge of collapsing and being transformed, uh, was an instance where the United States basically reversed what had been uh, an aggression by Saddam Hussein, who absorbed the state of Kuwait. Uh, and, in the, and we put together a coalition, a very broad coalition, not only internationally, but in the region itself, where Egypt and Syria and, and Saudi Arabia uh, were all part of a coalition in the context of a war. So it made perfect sense in the aftermath of that to do something about peace. And when the Clinton administration began, uh, you also had the advantage that you, you had a new government in Israel that had emerged a few months before. That government made the peace issue its priority. Uh, Rabin made the peace issue its priori his priority because he said, we have a moment here. Iraq has been weakened. Uh, if we look at the, at the threats that are going to come to us down the road, they're going to come from an Iran that could be nuclear. Uh, and it's very much in our interest to create peace with, our, with this inner corridor, with this inner circle. And if we do that, it'll strengthen us from a strategic standpoint. So you had an Israeli interest to focus on the peace issue. You had an Arab interest to focus on the peace issue precisely because they had aligned with us in war in terms of fighting a, quote, brother Arab. Uh, and so they had an interest in peace. And we had made as part of our commitment in terms of putting this coalition together that we wouldn't link the issues, but in the aftermath of, of uh, reversing the aggression, we would now go ahead and try to do something on peace. So you had a convergence of multiple interests that favored uh, doing this. So that context was dramatically different than the context today. Now fast forward to where we are today. Uh, first, we're, under, we're experiencing not an Arab Spring, but an Arab Awakening. Now, why do I say awakening as opposed to spring? Spring connotes a kind of very rapid change and all for the better and everything's going to flower soon and we're going to have this wonderful springtime and the, the kind of despotism of the past is going to re be replaced by enlightenment in the present. Uh, and that was never going to be the case. It's an awakening because you have many in the, uh, in the Arab world for the first time seeing themselves as citizens and not as subjects. That's a profound difference. Citizens have rights, they have expectations, they can make demands, they can hold their government accountable. And that's profoundly significant if in fact it can be, if, that, if accountability can be created. Why is this going to be a long process? Because none of the institutions for accountability exist today. They have to be created. Number one and number two, because the Islamists in the region were bound to have all the advantages in the early going. They're the only ones who were organized. They're the only ones who had an identity. They weren't associated with regimes that were seen as being corrupt. Uh, they have an authenticity because of their religious identity. So they had all sorts of built-in advantages. And the one thing that they're not identified with necessarily is that they really believe in democracy. Whatever they say, they don't necessarily believe in democracy. And we're seeing interesting moves in Egypt today. And we're seeing a backlash. And we can get into that if you want. But I think the point is, the context is totally different. You have, as you were saying, changes in each country. And it isn't the changes that take place in one country are not necessarily seen as a model for another. So how do you develop a basic approach? Where does the peace issue fit in? Uh, one of the, the great sources of frustration to Palestinians is in the last year, it isn't only that it appeared as if the United States wasn't focused primarily on this issue. Nobody in the region was focused on this issue. The Gulf states were focused on two threats, Iran, the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood. The Palestinians have been treated by them as an afterthought. Mm -hmm. Now, even though the Palestinian issue is still an issue that conjures up an issue of injustice, the fact of the matter is the focal point for almost every country in the region, particularly those that are undergoing change, is justice for themselves, self-determination for themselves the relationship between ruler and ruled. And the Palestinians are there, but there's this preoccupation with Iran. There's this preoccupation with what's happening in Egypt. We have probably 40,000 dead Syrians. Hard for that not to grab the attention of the region, particularly when it becomes also a kind of proxy battleground between <coughs> the Gulf states, particularly Saudi Arabia and Iran. So we'll look at all the changes that are taking place in the region, and then you have the question of peace. 
Now, the events that we just saw in Gaza are a reminder, well, you know, the Palestinian issue is not going to go away. But the Palestinian issue at this point is also a reflection of a division among Palestinians. You know, the uh, Mahmoud Abbas, the president of the Palestinian Authority, uh, had no role to play whatsoever in terms of what was going on in Gaza. The Secretary of State stopped in Ramallah because we would like him to have a role, but it's not because he had a role. Mm -hmm. The whole future of the Palestinians, what's their identity going to be? Is it going to be an Islamist identity? If it's going to be an Islamist identity, the prospect of making peace is close to nil. If it's going to be a nationalist identity, you may still have a possibility, but how does one deal with the fact that there's a division there? How does one build a broader strategy to deal with the changes in the region? Now, I'm posing great questions. I'm not necessarily answering the questions. <laughs> but I guess what I would say is the following. We should be guided by um, a number of considerations. Consideration number one. The awakening is a generational change. And I don't just mean it's generations. I'm saying it's going to take a generation to play out. Precisely because the institutions that need to exist for accountability have to be created. The backlash you're seeing in Egypt right now is because President Morsi <coughs> was basically trying to do away with the judiciary and any judicial restraints. And he thought because the, the prosecutor he was going after and the judicial restraints were a function of those judges appointed by Mubarak that somehow this would be fine. He could get away with it. Well, the fact is the judiciary is a symbol. Mm -hmm. And that symbol of his trying to overcome those kinds of limitations on him has produced a backlash among a very broad coalition of, of the secular forces in Egypt. We have to be mindful of the differences in each country, but we should be guided by a set of principles. Number one, uh, principles that take into account respect for minority rights. Think about how important that's going to be in this new Middle East where the, Egypt is a country that is unique in the sense that it's mostly homogeneous. But that's not the case throughout the region. Now, even Egypt, which is mostly homogeneous, 90% Sunni, 10% Coptic Christian. So respect for minority rights is tremendously important, but it's also practicality. Why? Uh, if the 10% of the, of the population feels that there's no security there and they leave in droves, who's going to invest in Egypt? So principle number one is respect for minority rights. That's going to be important for every country going through change in the region. Look at Syria. I mean, the Alawis <laughs> are a minority. They represent 12% of the population. The Sunnis are the majority. You need to create a post-Assad regime has to be inclusive. And the only way you're ever going to get the Alawis to somehow realize that their future is not caught up with uh, identifying with Assad, but seeing him as a threat to their salvation, is for them knowing that somehow their rights will be protected. Everywhere you look, in Iraq, almost every country you have significant minorities. Mm -hmm. Even in Saudi Arabia, where you don't have a significant minority, you do have them in one place. You know, the, the, Shi the eastern province, which has most of Saudi's oil, is a Shia province. So respect for minority rights should be a principle that guides us across the board and should, be, and should be a reflection of what our policy is towards the region. Not excluding half your population, meaning respect for women's rights. Here again, it's a practicality. In Egypt, 56% of the women are illiterate. Now, is there any prospect Egypt is going to become a successful society if that doesn't change? If the new constitution that they're drafting right now is shaped in a way that excludes women or treats them as second-class citizens? Very unlikely. It should be, again, one of our principles. Respect for pluralism, which goes beyond the issue of minority rights. And it says there should be a competitive political space. At a time when you have this awakening and people see themselves as citizens, if you don't do that, it's a prescription for ongoing upheaval. And that, again, is what you're seeing in Egypt today. And lastly, respect for your international obligations. Now, this relates specifically to Egypt because they have a peace treaty with Israel. But here again, it's a practicality. Who is going to invest in Egypt if they're not going to respect that treaty? And by the way, an interesting thing, we can get into this discussion if you want. Uh, President Morsi was a broker. It wasn't the Prime Minister of Turkey. It wasn't the Emir of Qatar. It was the President of Egypt, or at least 
he was the one who brokered using his intelligence channels. Why? Because he had a rela relationship with Israel. Could he have been a broker if he'd cut the peace treaty off? If he wasn't prepared to deal with Israel? The answer is no. He did something that also plays to the Egyptian self-image of having a prominent role to play in the region. The last couple of years of Mubarak's regime, Egypt was on the sidelines. The great paradox. Egypt has a self-image of being a leader of this part of the world. And President Morsi, notwithstanding their preoccupation with their internal needs, suddenly thrust Egypt back into that role. Why? Because he could talk to Israel. So these four principles I just identified should be a core around which we build our approach to all the countries in the region. Our readiness to provide support for them should be a function of how well they live up to these principles. If they're not willing to live up to these principles, they can make their own choices, and we should say that. We're not in a position to dictate to anybody. But we can certainly say, you make your own choices, but guess what? So do we. You live up to these principles, we'll mobilize support on the international stage for you. You don't, don't expect us to be providing support for you. That is a, a good point of departure. I would say we should pursue the peace issue, but we have to pursue the peace issue with our eyes open. Hamas is basically prepared, I think, to preserve this ceasefire. And we'll, we can get into why. But they're not prepared to make peace with Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, now, if they're prepared to adjust their behavior on the question of recognition and violence and terror, then obviously we should adjust our behavior as well. Peace is not a favor we do for anybody. And by the way, it's in Israel's interest to have a peace. And it's in Israel's interest to see if they can help uh, foster a reality where it's the nationalists among the Palestinians who represent the future, because they still at least identify a two-state outcome as being what they seek. Hamas does not identify a two-state outcome mm -hmm. as being what they seek. So um, now that we've taken care of that part of the, of the region. Let's move to Iran. Uh, you know, in the, it, I think there was an expectation uh, in the George W. Bush administration that there would have to be a major decision made uh, during that administration about whether or not to carry out a military strike against Iran. And um, uh, that decision was able to be pushed off. I think a lot of people expected that there was going to have to be a decision made in the first Obama term uh, regarding this, this, the same issue, and that uh, was able to be put off. And we've seen, for example, the, the effect of, of sanctions, but at the same time, the continuation of the Iranian efforts. So I think now people really expect that there's going to have to be a decision made on this during the second Obama term. Um, is there going to have to be a decision made in the second Obama term? And how you do know, you think through this question? OK. Um, can we go back to the first question? No, all right. Uh, I w here's what I, I will, s I'll frame this in the following fashion. 2013 will be decisive year one way or the other. Now, if I were to say to you, uh, starting in 2005, when I was outside the government, I would have Israelis coming to me and they would, starting in 2005, they would say, this is the year. Well, one of these years, this is actually <laughs> going to be the year. <laughs> But let me explain why I say 2013 actually will, in my mind, be decisive. I say it for two different reasons. One is because the sanctions really are having an effect. I want to explain that before I get to the other reason, which is their nuclear program continues to continue. And without, it's moving towards a point where we will reach a juncture where before the end of, two thirds, before the end of 2013, or at least by the end of 2013, we will not any longer be able to say that our, objection, our objective is prevention. Because we won't know whether we can actually produce prevention. Because the, the character of their program, the depth of their program, the number of, the amount of low enriched uranium they've accumulated, the medium enriched uranium they have, uh, the number of centrifuges they have operating, the combination of which could put them in a position where they could present the world with a fait accompli and say, OK, we now have nuclear weapons. And they would, even though, our stated that the President's declared objective, which he's been explicit on and very clear on, is prevention. By the end of 2013, we won't know any longer whether or not that objective is something that we can act on. So first, because the, the character of the sanctions, which are imposing a real price. Secondly, because of the pace of the nuclear program, 
this combination is going to produce some change one way or the other. Now, it doesn't mean it has to be military. There has to be a military answer to this. And it comes back, I come back to where I started, which was the issue of the, the sanctions and what's happening. About three weeks ago, the Supreme Leader gave a speech in which he said, and I'm quoting, the sanctions, his word, are brutal. Now, this is a guy who has always said, we've been under sanctions since 1979. We've lived with sanctions. The sanctions make us stronger. We're not afraid of the sanctions. You know, they make us self-sufficient, they give us strength. Now he says the sanctions are brutal, his word. He says this is economic warfare, his word. He gave two speeches within the space of these last three weeks where he called on uh, Iranian officials to stop fighting each other, stop criticizing each other. Why did he do that? Because the head of the Revolutionary Guard criticized the head of the Central Bank for what's happened to the currency. By some estimates, the currency is being devalued by about half every two months. Now, those estimates may exaggerate it, but one thing's clear. The currency is being dramatically devalued. Uh, and the head of this, think about it, the head of the Revolutionary Guard is criticizing the head of the central bank for what's happening to the currency. Now, you might ask the question, why would the head of the Revolutionary Guard be criticizing the central bank for this? Well, the reason goes back to the fact that the Revolutionary Guard basically is now embedded in the economy and controls about 35 to 40 percent of the economy. So the devaluation of the currency is hurting, guess who? The Revolutionary Guard. Now, they're a significant actor uh, in this polity. So that is itself is interesting. Now, it's also true that the head of the military criticized the Iranian president, Ahmadinejad. The Speaker of the Parliament criticized the, uh, the president for what he's doing to the economy. So the Supreme Leader is, is saying, stop fighting each other. Now note, in their criticism, who are they criticizing? Well, they're criticizing other Iranians. Are they criticizing us? You know why they're not criticizing us? Supreme Leader is, but you know why they're not criticizing us? Because nobody in Iran would buy it. They know that basically the regime has brought this on itself. Now, you know, I'm on a roll, so I'm gonna keep going. And, uh, <laughs> But just to give you a sense of how much what they're, what they're feeling, their output in oil used to be over 4 million barrels a day. Their output, their production, I'm not talking about their export right now, I'm talking about their production of oil. Their production of oil today is 2.6 million barrels a day because they had to stop pumping it, because they couldn't store what they couldn't sell. Because they can't, because of the sanctions, they can't get capital from the outside, technology from the outside, to revitalize what is, in fact, a dilapidated, desperately in need of infusion of, of capital and technology energy sector. And so they had to keep pumping because they have to maintain the pressure in their oil fields. And once they couldn't store it, they had to shut down these oil fields. It may not be so easy for them to recoup them. It means this is a long-term price that they're paying, and they're going to need help to recoup. 85% of the government's revenues comes from its export of oil. Now, the export of oil is down, it was at about 2.3 to 2.4 million barrels a day. I just said their total output is 2.6 million. Their actual export now is less than a million barrels a day. They are hurting, and this is when 85% of their revenues come from, from oil, even if they have some reserves, they eat up those reserves fairly quickly. So this is creating a pressure on them, and something's going to have to give from their standpoint. So that's one aspect of why 2013 is likely to be size. So the other aspect is what I said. The good news I just described that, all right, they're really feeling it. The bad news is, read the latest IAEA report, and they're not slowing down. They're continuing with their nuclear program. And so our stated objective of prevention is going to put us in a position where we have to do something, because by the end of the year, we won't be able to act on our objective. The combination, in my mind, makes it highly likely we're going to see some kind of new diplomatic initiative. I say that because it's not just President Obama, but particularly in an environment where we've fought two wars. You know, we're out of Iraq, we're in transition in Afghanistan, we've basically been in wars for the last 10 years. The idea that we would use force against Iran without going to the American public and demonstrating that we'd gone the extra mile, we'd done everything we could to avoid this, and if the Iranians brought this on themselves, it's just not credible. You know, I even think about 
you, know, you go back to the, the first Bush administration, the Gulf War I referred to before. I was with Baker when we went around the world and we, got a, we, we ended up in the Security Council in New York. We got an all necessary means resolution uh, that was going to kick in after 45 days if Saddam Hussein didn't back down. And yet, we'd been on the, we'd been on the road for three weeks. We finished close to midnight in New York and the President gets back and the first thing, I mean the Secretary gets back, the first thing the President wants is for him to show up at the White House in the morning and he has a private meeting and says, you did a great job getting that resolution. But I ought to be able to tell the American public, we did everything we could to avoid the use of force. And that's what produced an idea you know, to have got revised, to have Baker go to Baghdad, have Tariq Aziz come to, to Washington. That ended up producing a meeting in Geneva with Tariq Aziz instead. But the logic was to show we'd gone the extra mm -hmm. mile. President Obama will also unmistakably show we've gone the extra mile. And that will lead to a proposal on the table at some point that will, in some fashion, allow the, Pals allow the Iranians to have civil nuclear power, but with the kind of restrictions that would prevent them from being able to convert it into a nuclear weapons capability. Now, if the Iranians truly want a way out, they'll have a way out. Uh, if, you know, in the end, they're not prepared to accept what they say they're prepared to accept, meaning all they want is civil nuclear power. If in the end they're not prepared to accept that kind of a proposal, then we're headed towards a path where force is more likely to be used. But I believe there's, we will see some serious diplomatic effort first, uh, and this will come to a head sometime this year. Okay. Um, let me ask you one more right now, and then we'll open it up. And, and if um, nobody asks the question, the other questions I was going to ask will we'll come back to mine uh, later. Uh, You've, you, you were in the two terms of the Clinton administration, so you saw the transition from the first term to the second, and so you know what, what right. that's like. Yep. Um, their personnel changes, uh, and you know, we're expecting a number of changes uh, at the top. Right. Uh, they're also, you know, the president is freed from having to worry about re-election, uh, and so there are some opportunities, although uh, the window closes rather quickly as everybody focuses on the other people who are running uh, in this case for, for 2016. So can you give us a sense of the kinds of things that we should be looking for with respect to the, um, to, to the region we're talking about uh, as we move uh, from a first term to a second? Well, let's bear in mind one thing. The, the window does close sooner rather than later on domestic issues. Mm -hmm. It tends to, it doesn't really tend to close on foreign policy issues. I mean, we went to Camp David in July of 2000. Uh, so, you know, presidents have enormous capacity for initiatives in the national security area pretty much until the end of, of, their, of the term. <coughs> On the domestic side, the, your, your room for initiatives obviously dissipates as time goes by. Uh, you know, I think here we have, we're in a, we're the second term doesn't begin until January 20th. Uh, we have a Secretary of State who has declared she's leaving. Um, I think her position is that she's, uh, she'll stay until her successor is confirmed. But Secretaries of State get confirmed very quickly. So I mean, and I do believe that Secretary Clinton will, will work up until the last days. I mean, it's just, it's just it's in her DNA that that's the way she operates. Um, and I think, you know, the, uh, the ceasefire uh, is an example of her, of her readiness to roll up her sleeves and continue to do things. Um, the Middle East, almost by definition, we can, we can have a pivot to Asia as long as we have no illusions that that means somehow, you know, when it comes to the Middle East, if you think you can ignore the Middle East, sooner or late, later the Middle East imposes itself on you. Uh, and so we will have to deal with the Middle East regardless of, of um, whatever uh, other priorities we may also have. How you reconcile the priorities, that's a different issue. But I think that we will be active in terms of how we try to cope with and manage our response to the Arab Awakening. Again, what I was saying earlier, we're not the idea that we can somehow 
shape this region at this point is an illusion. There'll be a very powerful impulse on the part of every country to demonstrate their independence. Uh, and that's a fact. We, for our part, still have stakes. We have interests. And so we want to communicate you know, the basis on which we can have relationships and even on which we're prepared to have provide support. That should be very clearly communicated. There shouldn't be misunderstanding. There shouldn't be surprises. Uh, what you say in private should be unmistakable in terms of, of what we're prepared to do and under what circumstances. The peace issue is going to be very much a function of what the region itself makes possible. Mm -hmm. You know, I've often had the sense that there's this perception among many that, gee, if the US was just serious, we'd make peace. And that would be fine if we were party to the conflict. We're not. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you a story. One of, the, one of the times I was negotiating, it actually was between the Israelis and the Palestinians, and it was when I was actually doing the Hebron Accord. And at one point, we were caught up uh, in, a, in a negotiation that went to, you know, we were in the middle of the, you know, three or four in the morning. And we'd been going round and around and around uh, on the issue of, um, planning and zoning. Uh, and I finally, at one point, about 3.30 in the morning, uh, I thanked the two sides because I said, you know, before I did this, I used to work on very broad geopolitical transformations, the architecture of America's national security uh, on a from a strategic standpoint. And here I'm dealing with how far off the road uh, a dwelling, a building can be, and whether it can be six meters high or nine meters high. And I would never have learned these things if it wasn't for the two of you. But I have to let you know, um, there's a limit to how much time I can spend on this. And you just need to remember, I get to go home. You don't. You know, you have to find a way to live together. And, you know, <laughs> the broader point is, we can help. But if they're not prepared between the two of them to make peace, the idea that we're going to be able to impose it is an illusion. You know, oftentimes I hear, just go ahead and impose it. Well, one thing I can guarantee if you try to impose peace, maybe you can have, you can impose something and the first opportunity to defect from the agreement, you're going to see a defection in the region. If the parties themselves don't invest in it, don't own it, they won't stand up for it. And they will face inevitable opposition. One of the problems you face today among the Palestinians, I look at Abu Mazen and I think that Abu Mazen uh, has been, even before what just happened in Gaza, which made him seem even less relevant, I think that he's been very fearful about if he were to make certain concessions or if he was to compromise in some fashion, what the backlash would be he would get from the Muslim Brotherhood, from Hamas. Uh, and the point here is, there's a, the question is, who's going to determine the Palestinian future? If there's going to be an independent Palestinian state, it's not going to be because Hamas is going to produce it. Hamas has a strategy of resistance. Now, when it does the calm, it has to impose restraint, which means not resistance. But it doesn't have an alternative strategy. So if it's prepared to develop an alternative strategy, that's one thing. Abu Mazen has a stated objective of a two states. Uh, and the only way he can, he can fulfill a legacy is by being prepared to negotiate it. Now, we're also in an election period in Israel. Uh, and you know, I know this will shock most people here. Elections are probably not the time when you're going to produce breakthroughs uh, in peace. <laughs> So you're going to have to get beyond the elections. You're going to have to manage beyond the elections. Uh, and then Israel, too, has choices to face because you know, there is a demographic clock that is ticking. Uh, and if things remain as they are, Israel is going to be put in a position where sooner or later, to preserve its Jewish democratic character, it'll have to contemplate another unilateral withdrawal if, in fact, there isn't a negotiated pathway. Well, a negotiated pathway is dramatically better from an Israeli standpoint than a unilateral approach. But I would argue it's also dramatically better from a Palestinian standpoint as well. The sooner the Palestinians can actually reach agreements that they own, the sooner they have something to point to as an achievement. 
Um, well, we're going to open it up. I think we've probably got some microphones. I'm going to start over here. You mentioned that you had known me for almost 30 years. I've known Alan for more than 40. So I'm going to um, let him tell us sure. what question has come across from the online uh, viewers. Great. We've had a few questions, actually, about the uh, Palestinian situation. We've had a few even from about Iran. But there's one here from, uh, from the audience here around Turkey. For Ambassador Ross, Turkey's commitment to EU membership is wobbly. Erdogan wants nothing to do with Israel, but what can President Obama do to retrieve Turkey into our world, uh, into our sphere, before it's too late? Uh, it's a very interesting question. Um, you know, Turkey and Israel for a very long time had a strategic relationship. Uh, and a relationship that, by the way, um, was very close on a military level. Now, the question was not about Israel and Turkey. The question was about Turkey and our sphere. Turkey is still a member of NATO. Uh, we're deploying radars for missile defense to Turkey, which, whether anyone describes it this way or not, has their first utility against Iran. So the idea that Turkey is not an ally, they're still a member of the NATO alliance. And they show no interest in not wanting to be a part of the NATO alliance. Now, by the same token, you know, Erdogan has, has adopted a very tough rhetorical posture towards Israel. Uh, and, and by the way, that, that helped ensure that they had no role to play in brokering the ceasefire. Now, for the prime minister of Turkey, who sees Turkey having a role not just in the region, but internationally, this may be a lesson for him as well. I don't know if you've seen, but in the last couple of days, there's suddenly lots of stories about um, new talks between Turkey and Israel. Now, whether they're going to, whether and how they're going to materialize, I don't think it's an accident that that's suddenly emerging. Number one. Number two. Again, let's bear in mind it's something very interesting has gone on. Even though you have an estrangement between Turkey and Israel, and Turkey has downgraded its relationship from having an Israeli ambassador to the second secretary in the, in the aftermath of the UN report uh, that was issued about the flotilla, uh, this wasn't the first time Turkey downgraded its relations the same way. Uh, after the war in 1967, they did the same thing, uh, even though they maintained a military relationship. So there is some history for downgrading and then improving. Uh, and the other thing to, keep to bear in mind is that uh, the Turkey-Israeli trade relationship, commercial relationship, notwithstanding the political differences, in the last year increased by 41 percent. Then the trade, by the way, this isn't a case where the trade is very low and so when you can say 41 percent may not mean much. The trade between the two is between three and four billion dollars a year. And that includes the Israelis scaling back recently, this year. Um, their military sales to Turkey. Um, so I wouldn't assume that, you know, with all the difficulties and differences you may see, I wouldn't assume, A, uh, we may have differences with Turkey, but they're still a member of the, the NATO alliance. Uh, and it is Turkey that is turning to us now and the NATO alliance and wants the deployment of Patriot batteries along their border with Syria uh, as a way of not just providing a kind of air defense, but the, you have to understand the Patriots have an envelope where they can intercept uh, what could be uh, any plane or a rocket, but any plane. And that could actually create uh, what would amount to a no-fly zone over the northern part of Syria. So the idea that Turkey is somehow outside our sphere doesn't reflect the reality right now. The differences with Israel highlight the differences. The, the differences with the EU on membership, frankly, for a long time, Sir, Turkey sought entree to the EU. If you look at, you read the Turkish press in the last several months, and when they look at what's happening in the EU economically, they've been able to restrain their enthusiasm <laughs> for pressing this of late because they see their own, their economy has actually been doing pretty well. I don't know if anybody's been to Turkey lately, but. When you go to Istanbul, which, which is a city that is enormous, uh, you will see that the scope and the character of the building in Istanbul is actually breathtaking. So their 
you know, they're not saying they don't want to be a member of the EU, but they're no longer sort of, uh, you know, signaling that this is the most important thing to them. But that doesn't mean that it affects their alliance, their part of the NATO alliance. Great. All right, we'll open up. We have mics. Yeah. Oh, they're all right there. Oh, I didn't. Oh, how clever. We're, we're being very organized here. Wow. Um, here we have a, a question on, from Twitter. We've got a great Twitter community uh, that we now have uh, from Udit. And he asks, he says, President Obama repeatedly supports Israel's right to self-defense. Is there ever a legitimate Palestinian right to defense? And if so, when? An interesting question. Um, the only thing I would say is uh, when you fire rockets at cities, your sole target uh, is civilian, that's not a legitimate right of self-defense. You know, the, when, you, um, when you basically make it clear that civilians are your target, that's not a right of self-defense. Um, so, you know, the, if the Palestinians become a state, which you know, I would like to see a Palestinian state emerge because I think a two-state outcome is in the interests of Israelis and Palestinians alike. Under those circumstances, they clearly will have a right of self-defense and it will be governed by what are the traditional rules. Article 51 of the UN Charter says that every state has the right of self-defense. It's, yeah, I don't know where it's coming from. Okay, we'll just play through. Is it us? Okay. We can keep beat with it. You know, we can have right. pace. <laughs> <laughs> the other question here is uh, how much, you know, there's obviously announcement today that Ehud Barak is uh, exiting his role and retiring from public office. What are the implications for his exit? And even more specifically, uh, with the upcoming elections, is this also an indication of the movement to the right in Israel? No, I don't think it's an indication of the movement to the right in Israel. And I think um, you know, he's going to be 71 in February, uh, although I think he's a, he's, a, he's a young 71. So I don't think it's – I think that he's probably made the decision um, for a variety of reasons. I don't think it's because he sees a move to the right. In Israel, I think it's uh, it's probably for a set of personal reasons. Uh, number one, number two, he's a very significant figure in Israel. He's been a very significant figure in this government as a defense minister. Uh, certainly, he is a um, he's been as strong an advocate as anybody when it comes to Iran that Israel has to reserve the right to act on its own, even while he's. He has put a premium on the U.S.-Israeli relationship. Uh, he's also made it clear, ultimately, uh, Israel has to make its own decisions. Uh, and I have no doubt that, you know, he's, he would have, he has probably shaped the options and the operations that the, um, that the Israelis have prepared for the future if it comes to this. Uh, and he's obviously been very close to uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu on most, on, on most security issues as well. You know, bear in mind, he was the prime minister's commander uh, in the elite unit that he headed. And so even though they, you know, obviously they come from different political parties and they've had their differences, uh, they've also been extremely close in terms of how they look at security issues, security challenges, what Israel needs when it contends with that. Uh, he, you know, he will be, uh, he'll be a big 